very, very, very interesting. I like the note, but I'll just wish that um, hopefully next semester when we actually have our event, that you know you'd all show up here with your in your numbers, right? <laughs> and I think that is really what makes this um, event or the series try is that in numbers we try, right? So I'm very excited uh, to see you all here today. I am Kwame Edwin Ochu. I am actually the organizer of the African Study Tourism Series. And today I'm very happy to actually introduce to you the speaker. Um, but before I proceed to do that, I have one announcement that I'd like to make. Um, we have our last event on the 6th of December. And in that event, we have Professor Michael Dumas visiting us from uh, University of California at Berkeley. Professor Dumas' talk is entitled tentatively, running out of dams to give, refusing anti-blackness and, and settler colonialism in the next 25 years. So mind you, this title is actually subject to change, but then I'll be very, um, very quick to let you know when the title changes. Today we are actually very privileged to have with us today um, an intellectual, a scholar, a mentor, uh, who has actually been fundamentally a part of, you know, um, the cultivation of myself as a scholar. I first encountered uh, Professor Patricia McFadden in 2009 at Syracuse University, when I was still, like many of you, um, and, you know, growing. My group is actually <laughs> an authentic project because we always have to put ourselves in a constant state of growth, right? So I took a course with Professor McFadden that actually uh, fundamentally shifted the contours of my trajectory in terms of how to think about myself as a black, gay, and African man in the context of um, the United States, right? And I think that precisely because of this affinity I have with her is the reason why I stand in front of you today <laughs> Anna, You're too kind. To you. Thank <laughs> you so very much. So, um, Professor Patricia McFadden got her PhD in sociology from Warwick University in Coventry, United Kingdom. Her, her MA is in sociology from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. She has a BA in sociology <coughs> and political science, administration and economics from the University of Botswana, Lesotho, and Swaziland, DBLS. Her teaching experience spans a period of four decades in various parts of the world. She began teaching in 1976 as a graduate assistant in the Department of Political Science at the University of Botswana in Swaziland. And since then, she's actually taught and undertaken supervision at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels, as well as served in several capacities as a dean and as a head of department during various times in her teaching career. She was visiting professor you know, in the Sabo Indexi African Institute, Leadership Institute at UNISA in Pretoria, South Africa, and was actually an international, and still is an international advisory committee member um, with the Sabo Indexi African Leadership Institute. Professor Madal, Madal sorry. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I, I knew I was going to actually be in the so okay. with Madal. But clearly, this says a lot about what these women have done to me intellectually, right? But they mean a lot to me intellectually, and I appreciate um, having you all in my life. So Professor McFadden <laughs> has actually um, co-edited books in general, some of which have appeared in Southern Africa in Transition, Agenda Perspectives, Southern African Feminist Review, Reflecting on Gender Issues in Africa, Women and Employment in Africa, and over the last four decades, decades has been involved in the editing and publication of various newsletter and journals in the academy, as well as within women's organizations and movements. In fact, you know, Professor McFadden's laurels are endless, like the list really goes on and on and on. And I'm very, very truly honored to say that a course I teach here, uh, my pre thousand level course, which is actually entitled The Digital Struggle in the African Atlantic, is actually building upon a course I took with her, right? So somehow, I, I'm very sorry to say that I plagiarized. It's okay. Myself. It's 
it's my it's gift so, to you. Thank you. <laughs> Mine, uh, Africa, Mine does basically try to add the Atlantic to it, which Wonderful. is basically the same concept. <laughs> but I'm very, very honored to introduce to you today Professor McFadden, whose talk is entitled Contemporarity in Africa, Feminist Perspectives of an Alternative Future, which I will give a hand of applause. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank, you so <laughs> oh, thank you, Kwame. You're too kind. Thank you. It also, it's really a blessing for me to be in Kwame's life. And so it's a mutual, a friend of mine used to say, it's a club of mutual admiration. We all should be part of a club where we admire each other mutually. It's gifts. It's gift giving outside of commodity circuits, outside of commodified and bought and sold things. It's like, you know, human love. And I'm going to be speaking about humans today, how who we are and some of the trajectories that are that look like they are possibilities. <clears throat> and I'm going to try and set a rhythm of speaking that will be comfortable to you, but also will enable me not to trip on my tongue. Um, uh, so the timing, Kwame, uh, we, I need a signal from you. Okay, so uh, according to my one, it's, uh, okay, just about half past three. And I am going to read because I tend to wander away. <laughs> you know how it is, right? When you like what you're doing, you want to say all of the things that you like <laughs> that give you pleasure. So I'm going to read it as slowly and as carefully as possible. And then I'm looking forward to question time when we can talk. I'm going to try and stay within the, uh, the time allocated. So uh, first of all, I want to thank Kwame and his colleagues for making it possible for me to be here today. It's a great pleasure to share this time with you. And I hope that pleasure will be the main intellectual emotion that will connect us during this hour or so that we will be conversing. I come from the place where humans stood up and took the first step into the future called Africa. Although the racist-inspired denials about human origins have tended to die down more recently, the apparent need to contest this scientific fact still lingers within the core of supremacist discourse. But that is not of importance, and it never really was to most Africans anyway. I often use this momentous shift into our becoming human as a stepping stone in contextual and conceptual terms, excavating the dynamic of a profoundly significant gesture so as to experience myself as an African, female and black in different and powerfully intimate ways. So I'm using these identity markers in a lateral sense, as an intersectional site where I continuously reimagine myself. Contextually, and this is really a large part of what I'm going to be speaking about today, I'm talking about context, because we define context in the ways in which we retrieve it, the significances that we give it, the meanings, but also the opportunities that we excavate, that we draw from context. Africa as a context means so many other amazing things juxtaposed to the big hegemonic colonial narrative that it is a place of darkness. And we all know, of course, that Conrad was speaking about his own dark heart, his own dark Western heart, right? But these hegemons, ideological, literal, textual, are so dominant that they shut everything down, you know, and just obliterate any memories that we have of ourselves and where we come from and who we were and are. So I'm using context in um, an, uh, what I'm exploring as an interesting conceptual 
uh, kind of exploration. All right. So contextually, I have found that by retrieving imaginaries of Africa, spatially and humanistically, which enhance the amazement of who we are as beautifully creative creatures, I am able to step back from the dominant, often overwhelmingly negative narratives of colonial racist contempt and condescension. I'm also able to begin leaning away from nationalism and neocolonialism, the latter understood as the political and ideological process by which black heterosexual men on the African continent have been consolidating their class positions and power through impunitous and often brutal uses of state repressive infrastructures. Now, what African men are doing on the African continent is not new and peculiar. You know, men have done this for hundreds of centuries. Uh, they invented the state through impunitous, supremacist, brutal, misogynistic practices, you know, slaving. Or, it's, so it's not peculiar, but because it's very contemporary in this uh, globalized capitalist world, it seems so barbaric <coughs> and peculiar to being black and African, because it works well with the, the, stere the racial stereotypes, you know. But actually, it is a, a universal historical, his story, phenomenon of the journey that humans have taken. And it really lies at the foundation of the challenges that are posed to us all as humans, particularly as humans who live on the continent, how to get past it. And I'm, uh, in my presentation, I'm going to make some proposals. So I've spent many years trying to understand the logic of nationalism because my political consciousness as a radical African person was tempered in the cauldron of anti-colonial liberatory engagement and struggle. And my feminism is still deeply marked by nationalistic instincts, which I'm struggling to unlearn for reasons that are becoming more urgent as I take the new turns in my personal and larger political rethinking as a contemporary radical feminist. Besides providing a large and open platform for all Africans who resisted colonial occupation, nationalism, and I think here too it's very similar, nationalism has functioned as a facilitator for black male class and sexual hegemony on our continent. Nationalism has enabled for feudal systems and practices of cultural authenticity to persist in the exercise of hegemonic masculinist impunity in most relationships between women and men across African societies. It also continues to provide the social cultural exclusionary legitimacies against all groups of Africans who adopt alternative identities and are consequently, consequently constructed as other in relation to being real Africans i.e. heteronormatively conforming individuals. Fanon, whom I'm sure you all know, he must be one of your familiars, France, the great France. <laughs> Fanon most presciently understood and critiqued this classed tendency of, of the ideology of nationalism. And I have a somewhat adequate understanding of the phenomenon in a larger sense because I've spent a lot of time really critiquing nationalism and trying to disentangle myself from it because that's where I learned how to resist. Besides, of course, the fact that I was born radical. I mean, I was like completely, you know, uh, unconstrainable. And my mother always said, oh, you know, you're really a difficult child. I'm like, thanks for the compliment. So I've remained, you know, rebel, a rebel, and I'm rebellious, and I love it. And I'm going to try and share with you what it has translated into in my life. So I have a somewhat adequate understanding of the phenomenon in a larger sense. And therefore, although I critique it, I keep those insights of nationalism within reach as I travel along the new intellectual trajectory that I'm engaged in crafting at the present time. But this is not what I want to focus on today. 
One of the tasks I set myself throughout my life as a deliberately radical female person is to resist and unlearn the dominant constructions of who I am or should be that are continuously imposed and reiterated by heteronormative notions and expectations everywhere I live and work. There's no distinction between North America, Europe, and the African continent, which are the three big spaces where I've worked and lived. So in making the retrieval, in making the retrieval of what is most beautiful and creative about being African and black, a core element of my radical self and life politics, I have focused on, on both the stepping back from the hegemonic heteropatriarchal narratives while I'm searching for the dynamic energies that are the source of human life, particularly for us as African people. In these senses then, Context is not only about spatiality. Of course, we live in time, space, and motion. But it is also very crucially an ideational opportunity to reinvent ourselves. When we approach context, we create the opportunity to reimagine ourselves. We humans are the greatest inventors in the universe. It's our special gift as living, moving matter to also continuously reimagine and change our relationships with each other and with other sentient forms of energy on our planet, now more so beyond the boundaries of our known universe. In setting the context as African intellectuals of coming from a vibrant place and space where what we understand as be being human begins, okay, in setting this context, we also initiate a political process of self-retrieval from patriarchally repressive imagery and signs, and we embark on what I'm calling contemporarity, as a sensibility of the immense power and capacity which we are endowed with when we are born. Context is the retrieval of deliberately erased knowledge and productive intellectual instincts, which and it also becomes the opportunity to craft new theoretical and explanatory frames of new activism, within which the glimmers of an alternative to heteropatriarchy and imperial capitalism can be imagined and explored. Recognizing and acknowledging this foundational truth about the meaning of being human is vitally important, especially in this moment in social time. The human condition is defined by our recognition of what it is that fractures us and or by a celebration of that which makes us infinitely creative and viable. Scrutinizing this intersection, which is created by our immense capacities to be expansive beyond even our own often bounded imaginations, that is what makes the difference between progress and backwardness. My notion of contemporarity, which I must say is largely exploratory and which still feels like an intellectual instinct. I mean, I am like exploring like, <laughs> not like Stanley, of course, but you know, you know who Stanley is, right? That nasty, stinky uh, <laughs> missionary who went all over the continent laying the ground for what had became 500 years of plunder. But I'm exploring. This notion lies at the interface between defining context as a, dif as a dynamic ongoing process and stimulating my human agency towards an alternative trajectory of wholeness. While on the one hand, my sense of the urgency to craft alternative radical thinking opportunities has become a personal imperative, given that the conceptual landscape of feminism in Africa has been so distracted by nationalism as a fundamentally reactionary ideology. And I think here too, black feminism has been so affected and distracted by the persistence, the hegemonic presence of nationalism as a black male ideology. And we can talk about this 
I know some people are already feeling uncomfortable in their skins, like, you know, how dare she come here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I dare. Mm -hmm. I always dare. <laughs> I always dare. Because if we don't dare, we don't grow. So we're going to talk about it, no doubt. So let me start. While on the one hand, my sense of the urgency to craft alternative radical thinking opportunities has become a personal imperative, Given that the conceptual landscape of feminism in Africa has been so distracted by nationalism as a fundamentally reactionary ideology, contemporary, contemporarity not only provides me with new stepping stones into what feels like immensely productive intellectual possibilities, but it also enables me to return to myself as a central subject in my own life and in redefining how I live and interact with people in my lifescapes in personal and political ways. It is pivotally about continuously retrieving the ability to reimagine the future in multi-diverse ways, always against the grain of patriarchal and class infrastructures of conformity and homogenization. Struggles for inclusive social justice are the contemporary prison, the cutting edge of a reimagined humanism, and how, for Africans, this is embedded in anti-colonial dreams and struggles for wholeness, as well as in contemporary resistances against neo-imperial and neoliberal exclusions. Recognizing the sameness that capitalism, racism, and neoliberal plunder impose on all humans was situated outside the parameters of privilege and entitlement <coughs> And finding new ways to respond to this exclusion is the new imperative. From Black Lives Matter to Roads Must Fall, we are reiterating the insistence that our humanness can never be erased. And we are calling towards a new humanism. This resurgent rising to the challenge, to challenge the monster of supremacy and impunity across the divides of space and the imperial hegemonic infrastructures of extraction and imposed homogeneity, this rising, resurgent rising reiterates the unbreakable ties that bind us as African people in the contemporary world. It is the youth who are marching on the front lines once again against the fascism and disdain of imperial capitalist arrogance. We are truly in a new moment of social and political time. And the rallying call is to take back ourselves and craft the new political and activist futures. The old ways, the old ways of theorizing and explaining capitalism's egregious impacts upon our lives have been eclipsed by the seemingly inescapable ability of the system to find ways of reinventing itself and morph into new forms of exploitation and repression. And thus far, it has done so very successfully everywhere. You can go everywhere. I mean, you know, after 2008, people were like, okay, you know, the system is down. But they rebooted and they're back up. In, you know, emphasizing the militarism and the intervention and the, you can see it, you know it, you feel it. Yeah? Therefore, we have to find the new ways of resistance. And for me, it's by re one of the ways is by retrieving the courage of our most beautiful ones. James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, Claudia Jones, Ella Baker, I.B., Ida B. Wells, Nawal El Sadawi, Fatma Menisi, Franz Fanon, Che Guevara, Antonio Gramsci, our Tiam, I could go on and on the whole afternoon. We have the beautiful ones. They have been born. You remember um, Ayikwe Ama's novel, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born? Well, but they, they are actually, they have been born. Yeah. And excavate the new from the incorrigibility of those who have come before us. Contemporarity that rhythm of the new in the legacies of past resistance and dreams of dignity. Contemporarity not only illuminates these legacies of shared collective resistance for an inclusive humanism,
but it also provides a window into the possibilities of doing the new radical work, and for me, in feminist terms. I have already alluded to the sensibility that the notion of contemporarity feels like opening a window on endless theoretical and intimately personal political and real lived possibilities. So let me conclude this conversation with you uh, by pointing out another feature of contemporarity that is one of the most attractive elements of this exploratory theoretical journey, uh, journey I have embarked upon over the last de decade and share how it is enabling me to return to the core feminist mantra of the personal is political through the notion and practice of integrity, bodily, emotional, and sexual integrity. And I have kind of focused into that because for me, 40, 45, 50 years of being feminist, I think I was, I was about 12 when I read Simone de Beauvoir and after that, it was over for patriarchy. I was never gonna be in a cage, you know? <laughs> that was it, you know? So, um, for me, as a feminist, you know, integrity is so foundational to the identity of being a free woman, to the experience, to the struggle of being free, of experiencing freedom, not the way it is articulated in constitutions you know, or declarations, but really as a lived reality. And so I've returned to these foundational markers of who, who I made myself into, which is like the most stunning and scary thing for most Africans. I mean, a black woman who actually defines herself and refuses any other interventions is crazy. And I'm going to, uh, let me read it. I mustn't ramble. You see, I'm walking away now along a little path. I have to stop there. I'm coming back, right back to the text. Okay, so the centrality of integrity is so crucial in understanding all the, the challenges that we face, both in terms of you know, resisting patriarchy and everything else that accompanies it, but also in terms of celebrating our beautifulness as humans. Contemporarity speaks to a personal sensibility in the particular locations that one inhabits, in spatial, ideological, structural, and activist terms. The sites of interaction and engagement with one's body as a lived in, lived through reality, and the challenges that I, as a woman face in relation to heteropatriarchal intrusions and violations, as well as the joys and the delights of being able to enjoy the fullness of one's humanity and personhood through self-defined identities <coughs> and shared collective notions of community and political activism. Today, I'll only touch on these elements as expressions of the new foraging I am undertaking in theoretical and intimate landscapes that are important familiars of my feminist identity and practice. By situating myself at the interface of theory and praxis in new and alternative ways, I'm crafting, but I'm also contributing <coughs> to the new feminist humanism of living my political ideas and dreams. And it is a truly beautiful gift that I'm giving myself. I found that the new creativities and insights I'm articulating as I expound on contemporarity are directly linked with my vegan lifestyle, growing most of my own organic food, and choosing celibacy as an expression of my new sense of self in an aging female black body. I'll speak briefly to these three areas of new feminist sensibility in terms of how they are changing the larger notion of integrity as a core feminist idea in politics and how they are significant expressions of the person I'm becoming as I enter the last century of my, uh, the last quarter of my century. Bri but briefly, how did I get to this place of alternative feminist introspection? You might be wondering. I sometimes ask myself that question too. Essentially, I realized after uh, oh, 30, 40 years, I realized that there was no room for my radical ideas and self in the African women's gendered movement. 
which was and is an extension of black male reactionary nationalist politics and practice. I kept on trying to fit myself as a square peg into a round hole, basically. And uh, the backlash was persistent, you know, from being a slut because I wrote about pleasure and sexuality and living in a female body to, you know, being deported from Zimbabwe um, as an alleged homosexual. And I'm saying alleged because I'm talking about the criminalization of homosexuality through the infrastructures of the state. And the horror of not having solidarity at the moment when I was hanging by the skin of my teeth. And I had assumed that, you know, I was part of a movement of women who loved each other enough, not sexually, because the most of the women, you know, compulsory heterosexuals who treat their heterosexuality as normal and had tremendous difficulties talking about it, you know? But it, it was such a moment of awakening to find myself isolated on my own. And Kwame and I were talking about it, that actually the majority of humans are reactionary and conservative. And accepting that is so powerful because then you don't transpose your dreams of radicalness, of radical life onto people who actually have not cultivated the capacity to understand what you're saying, what you're thinking, where you're, and they don't want to come with you. So they might perform the spectacle of solidarity, but when it comes down to the crunch, you're hanging in the wind. <laughs> you're hanging in the wind. And it's a lesson that you learn as a radical, that you just hold on as long as you can, and usually another radical will come. And then, you know, you can find the corner somewhere and lick your wounds and come back raging, raging and fierce, which is what I've done. But for, for 30, 40 years, I pretended to myself, I knew that they were reactionary, but this is what nationalism does, you know? It kind of creates a delusion that, you know, we're gonna, and it's this whole thing about conforming. Anyway, we'll talk about it during the discussion because I'm wondering again. So how did I get to this place? Essentially, I realized there was no room for my radical ideas and self in the African women's gendered movement, which was and is an extension of black male reactionary nationalist politics and practices. I can speak further on this during the discussion. I also realized that until I engaged in the daunting yet apparently necessary task of daring to dream feminist dreams in new ways and thus of becoming part of the emerging alternative, which is always there in the dynamic process of human experience anyway, until I dared, I would basically become emotionally and intellectually stunted and stayed. Mm. I've successfully resisted becoming a colluder in the neocolonial project. I've refused to enter the state. I don't traffic in the state at all. I refuse. So I'm out there on the periphery, you know. <laughs> and of course, they punish you because you refuse to be like everybody. Huh? And I'm very proud of my consistently radical identity and lived practice. However, having stepped away from the gendered nationalist movement as a political and activist space, I found myself in the gap, in the gap between a past that I increasingly rejected and you can look at my writing, it's available in the open comments, and which I feel, I feel increasingly embarrassed about, that I actually was a nationalist feminist, and a future. So there was this gap that I found myself in, where I had, you know, this identity that I had now to accept was no longer viable, and on the other hand, I had a future that was still largely undefined and daunting in many ways. Then a very personal, intimate event occurred just over a decade ago, which thrust me deeper into the gap, leaving me floundering in emotional and spiritual ways that threatened to overwhelm and extinguish my life. I lost someone I loved more than I can remember loving in all the lives I've lived before. I 
felt cheated by the universe. And the sense of loss was greater than the sense of jure de vivre that had nurtured me through many crises and struggles for half of my lifetime. But eventually, my instinct to live overcame the desire to go searching for my son. And I brought my feet back onto terra firma and took the next step into a future that was hazy and which is still feels uh, uncharted. I was starting all over, but now it becomes a little more coherent. But you know, I, I got a fresh start. My parents had bought a farm on the Lubombo mountain along the eastern boundary of Swaziland with Mozambique where I'd grown up wild and free on a mountain that means the backbone of the earth in Siswati. So, to crawl out of the gap, I returned to my childhood as a space, a memory, and a notion, an idea of home, which offered me the possibilities of moving on. Over the past decade, I have navigated multiple minefields deep-seated heteropatriarchy and misogyny within the family into which I had been born. You can imagine, you know, I'm like, I think I'm one of the most radical humans that is alive. I mean, I really work on it, okay? And so if I'm not one of the most radical humans, I need to do a bit more work. But I'm very, very radical. I know myself. If I don't know it, then I'm going to have to wait for someone to tell me which of course is unacceptable. So, I navigated this hatred. I'd been born into this family and I was astounded most of the time by the viciousness of the backlash against my sense of self-love and my autonomous lifestyle. They kept on demanding that I become a woman why can't you just be a woman, they kept on insisting, you know? In the deeply backward feudal senses that most women in that vicious dictatorship conform to. And of course, that demand, that insistence, and the punitive behavior, the threats of exclusion against me, that just made me fiercer and more determined to be even more radical every day. So it was a war zone for the past decade. And throughout this brutal battle, to not only retain the parts of myself that I loved and honored, and to grow the person that I had brought to the mountain, but also the necessity of finding my path into the future, throughout that battle, I turned to nature the source of our very existence. And I began the process of learning in new ways how to appreciate and honor the earth. The multitude of sentient living beings around me and of always vigilantly being on the outlook for the new and alternative ways of being. It worked. This is where I chose to relocate myself. And my notion of contemporarity offers us all, those of us who imagine ourselves radical, offers us the opportunity to ask a different set of questions about how we live and how we do the radical work and to explore the possibilities of finding the new ways of being radical, of being feminist and being you know, if you work in the law, if you work in care, whatever it is you do, the notion of contemporarity, of becoming contemporary in deeply radical political ways, that notion is an opportunity to craft the new radical, theoretical and activist <coughs> possibilities. So it worked for me. It has worked. I had locked my gate in a community that was open, nobody locks a gate where I live on the mountain. And the assumption is that anybody drunk at three o'clock in the morning on a Friday or Saturday night can knock on my door and say, my cousin, I'm hungry. Do you, or do you have some more booze? And I, have, I am obliged, you know communities like that? Hello, 
Yes. And I would be obliged to crawl out of my bed and open my door and, you know, provide alcohol and food for this lush, this loser, okay, who insists that because he is part of my family or family, not necessarily through blood, but because we've all grown up in the community, that I have to. And after all, I'm a woman. It's my job to comfort men in whatever way they need. So I locked my gate. I just locked it and I told them when I moved, because oh, let me tell you, I, I can fight, okay? I'm fierce. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I told them, I'm locking my gate, do not come to my gate. If you want to speak to me, if you want to see me, phone me. They said, oh, she wants us to make appointments to see her. I said, no, 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 I will call you too before I come to your house. So I gated myself, not in the elitist, you know, sort of super rich, affluent, you know, yeah, isolating me, but in terms of creating a space where I could retrieve myself, but protect myself from that patriarchal imposition that I have to be what people want me to be. I locked my gate figuratively and literally stepped back from what is called family, which I had known through feminist historiography as the deepest and most dangerous place for women, because it is a site of male supremacy and misogyny, and which I encountered in daily battles to retain my personhood. And I'd refused to participate in the altruism and the self-demeaning that is required of women everywhere. I insisted that I was enough for me. I was enough for Patricia. They still, they're still offended by my audacity. And some of them continue to slander me, call me a slut. You know, I'm a sexual predator. How come she looks like that? It's because she's, she's after our sons or our nephews, you know. Because, yeah, being vegan, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm 66 and I look good, okay? <laughs> That's the value, that's the benefit of, you know, loving your body in the new alternative ways, you see. And not putting the trauma of dead animals in your body, you know, and the steroids and the antibiotics that bloat you out and, and all the stuff that goes on. So, I insisted I was enough for myself. They call me a mad woman, which is code for free woman, of course. And sometimes they even threaten my life. There's one of them who threatens to just take the shotgun and blow me away. But I've taught myself to lean back from the noise of it all and to focus on growing Patricia in the little world of living and nurturing beings that surround me. Growing my food. I grow about 80% of my food now. You can look at my hands. They know the earth. They know the power of the earth because they go into the earth. So growing my food without polluting the earth and or participating in the genocidal capitalist extractionism which characterizes so-called agriculture all around me in Southern Africa in ways that are mind-boggling. I have a PhD in agribusiness. Uh, which is like scary because I'm like, why did I spend four years studying you know, how they destroy the earth, but maybe it was a necessary part of arriving where I am. So this growing of my food has become another reality that allows me to experience freedom in the alternative ways. I'm continuously astounded and delighted in beautiful ways by the generous and bountiful nature and bountifulness of nature when we respect its integrity and essential being. And this has become a core element in redefining how I feel and live in my increasingly loved and aging body. Because what women learn is that when you stop having the capacity to breed, you're no longer a woman. You know? Oh, what are you? You're just an old head. You're a bag. You're a cow. You're, you know, all those adjectives, those vicious adjectives that just erase us from the humanness of who we are. And we learn 
you know, to leave our bodies. We leave them. We can't live in them because they're considered so ugly and so, you know, unattractive. And because they don't, they don't breed. You know, they, they don't conform to particular notions of what a beautiful body is. And so in, in positioning myself with this, in this relationship with nature, with the integrity that is so fundamental to being alive in nature, I have loved my aging body. I've learned to love it. From planting the seeds, carefully coaxing the new seedlings into the habitats that I've cultivated for them, watering and touching them, walking among them, navigating the presence of other beings, for example, moles and hedgehogs, for example, they are there. You know, I, I learned out of an instinct that the mole was not an irritant. You know, it eats very little, the carrots mainly and the turnips, and the cassava and the sweet potato, and usually they choose the juiciest ones. <laughs> so I must say, it actually is quite uh, disappointing because you, you pull out the plant and the largest <laughs> sweet potato is hollow because the mole has eaten most of it. You know, but in agriculture as it is now known, so commodified and so alienated, moles are pests. And yet they are the lungs of the earth. Because when they push up that soil, first of all, they bring the nutrients that are underneath the soil, but they also enable the earth to breathe, especially given this moment of climate change and heating up the earth and poisoning the earth. So the moles are a gift to me in my garden. And the hedgehogs, of course, that you know roam around. So I pick the, are they, what are they called? Those thorns? Oh, no, they're not thorns, what are they? those sticky things of the hedgehogs. You know they have black and white, black and white. There's a word for it. I pick them and I have a small collection in my kitchen, you know. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, it's a signal that somebody visited my garden at night and, you know, they're very shy of the day, so they move at night. I'm just, these are little anecdotes, um, you know, which are part and parcel of finding myself in the new ways. So I'm navigating the presence of other beings like moles and hedgehogs, which harvest where they have not sown, and accepting, I'm accepting our collective ownership of the harvest that nature bestows on, each, on us each season. This is the wonderment that stimulates my intellectual and emotional sensibility, and I feel joy about it. It enables me to approach the financial precarity, the financial precarity which inevitably accompanies my insistence that I will always be radical. It helps me to approach this with a sense of understanding that having chosen to become and to be always a person that I respect and love in this way, I will have to pay a small price in financial terms. So I don't have the fancy pension, you know, and all that stuff which a lot of people don't have because under capitalism, it can be wiped out by a crisis. So it's a fiction that they sell us. We spend our lives, the best years of our lives, fantasizing that we will have security in the future. It's part of the big lie to basically screw us for our labor, extract the best years, the strengths, the ideas, the creativity, and in the process, dull us and lull us into this false sense of security. And then 2008 happens, and <laughs> and where are you going to go? A lot of people take their lives because they've never imagined themselves in the future in another way. They've accepted the status quo claim that if you're good, if you behave yourself, you're a good girl, a good boy. Stay in the system, don't rock the boat, stay in the cage, don't point at the bars. Just imagine that you don't, there's no bars around you, that you will in the end grow gracefully old with the security that the capitalist system and the state will provide you. But it's not guaranteed. Like they do in the Constitution, they tell you that you have freedom of speech, you know? And then they arrest you the minute you say something that doesn't even begin to say what you need to say. Just you're thinking about it and they come for you. So 
For me, next to the immense sense of fulfillment that I'm enjoying by living vegan, honoring the earth, learning to recognize the alternative for my daily interactions with healing herbs and plants that nurture me, and I share this with my neighbors who are wrecked by HIV, by economic and social exclusion, their bodies are in such bad shape. You know, I understand because of this that so-called financial security is a myth. Now, my refusal to collude, and I'm finishing now, this is the last, my refusal to collude and grow up, as some of my colleagues have whispered in my ear each time I'm refused a job in the academy, they always tell me, yeah, but Pat, you know what? I mean, when you're young, you can be radical, you know? But why don't you grow up? Become an adult, you know? Then you get a job. So, my refusal to collude completely outweighs the feeling of anxiety about aging without adequate financial security. Something that, as I've said already, is largely a fiction that is tragically exposed each time the capitalist <coughs> system goes into crisis. So, in excavating the new ways of living that are so enriching and which are changing the meaning of freedom for me in human and feminist uh, terms, I'm building longevity into my life beyond the chronology of declaring that I plan to live to 100 years old, which I do, by the way. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be 100 plus. I was thinking, yeah, I need to aim for 120, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, they say what? Aim for the sun, you fall on the moon, right? <laughs> so, and this declaration often still leaves most of my friends, the people I know, stunned. And it gives me a mischievous sense of pleasure that I've actually, uh, you know, kind of awakened them. And finally, in creating a sufficient ecosystem of life for myself, which provides my body, my spirit, my emotional <laughs> territories, and the very essence of how I experience my being with endless opportunities for living a joyous life, I am also celebrating Alice Walker's wisdom in living lives of joy as a treasured part of living as radical black women <clears throat> in the alternative universe that each of us can craft and share as we re-envision our futures as free humans beyond the confines and restrictive boundaries of the heteropatriarchal system and its malevolence. This is the intention of contemporarity and the search for freedom in the futures that await us. Thank you for your audience. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I didn't eat up too much of the time. No, you are actually right on time. Am I? So, oh, yes. So um, there's room for questions. We have a lot of room. So please, if you have questions, hopefully. Yes, please. Any yeah, question, you can ask me any question. As I'm fearless, so I'll answer any question. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, yes. Habarizako. Um, <laughs> Okay, so it's a really good question because you're opening the door for me to actually 
uh, explain that I don't operate that way. For 40 years, I was part of a large movement, of large movements that were rescue movements. And I don't do rescue anymore. First of all, because I had to rescue myself and learn how to rescue myself from the challenges of life. But also, that made me realize that the big movements don't work anymore. The moment has changed. The shift has occurred. It's not just about imperial uh, capitalism and the reinvention of colonialism, but it's also largely about ourselves as humans. We have moved, not necessarily in a linear way, but we've grown, we grow in all kinds of directions as humans, and we craft forms that we use either to exploit or to resist. And resisting through uh, community organizations, you go into a community and you, no, it doesn't work like that anymore. At least that's what my notion of contemporarity is trying to argue. So where I live, like I told you, the community where I live, they're right wing, reactionary, you know, and this is universal. And women spend huge chunks of their lives trying to convince people who really are not, they don't have the capacity to hear what you're saying when you're radical. Unless you're like them, and then you may be able to open little crevices, you know? But it's always reformist, it's always incremental, and never changes the system, you see? So at this point in time, I don't do that. I actually, uh, because I'm spending like 98% of my, the rest of my life on Patricia, you know, I decided this is time for more. So the other 2%, I, if I, am, you know, a friend is ill, for example, there's a lot of diabetes, then I will explain to them why they have diabetes. Not the way the doctor does, but I explain it in terms of, you know, the capitalist production systems, the chicken and the pork, you know, and all that, you know, contaminated, polluted stuff that people are just, you know, and they're addicted to this stuff, okay? And it causes such disruption and disequilibrium in our bodies <coughs> that our bodies just die. Diabetes is really your body dying because it can't handle the poisons and the toxins, okay? So uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, I explain to my friends, the ones whom I care enough about, you know? I also treat a lot of people in my career, but, and I always tell them, I'm, I'm not working for you. I'm, I don't get paid by your government, okay? So don't behave as though I owe you something. Oh, you're never there. And my feet, he's got, he eats red meat, he's an old man, he eats red meat, he has gout. And I've been explaining it to him. Say, Guru, you know, Mze, granddad, stop eating the red meat. That's why you can't even touch your feet because the, the, the arthritis gout is a form of rheumatism. You know, and you, it's linked directly with the cholesterol in the red meat. But he keeps on eating it and then he sends his children to come and ask me to make him imbita. Imbita is a concoction of herbs. I grow lots of herbs. Half of my garden is just herbs, you know. They can't sleep, they're stressed, so I give them the lavender and all, you know. But I always tell them that it's because I want to. It's not because I have to. You say, oh, but you went to school, you know these things. Still, I don't owe you anything. You know, I'm just doing it because, you know, I like you. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't do it. I'm not obliged. Always having to push against the patriarchal assumption that women should be altruistic and self-giving and you consume yourself because you want to rescue everybody. I don't do rescue politics, honey. So thank you for that question, you know, because we have to redefine the politics, the way in which, excuse me, the way in which we do it, what it means, the new forms, and people must take responsibility. Everybody has agency, take responsibility, you know, for yourself. I'll share my knowledge with you and help you to maybe get on your feet, but you have to walk the, the walk yourself, you know. <laughs> I have my own stuff to do too. 
So yeah, I don't do that. But I do, I do healing. And as I said, it's on my terms. And if they don't listen to me and they keep on eating the red meat, I tell them, don't send your children for the concoction anymore. And don't come to my gate. My gate is like this amazing metaphor. When I've had enough of somebody, I tell them straight, don't come to my gate. Do not come to my gate. And then that's it. So it's a new activism. It's the new political work. Yes. Anybody else have a question, please? OK. Yes. Um, you mentioned how, um, you mentioned how the family structure is dangerous yes. to women yes. um, with a tendency to um, promote or demand uh, submissive, yes. um, obedient women. Yes. So my question would be, how do women, religious women and men, yes. who, who, like, who, who, are, who have, I guess, traditional religious values grapple Yes. That we have to ask permission from the head of the male patriarchal head of the family to um, go out yes. and live their life, to, yeah. to get education, yeah. to um, move And out. work for the men. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't live that way. So I, I, I really am just going to answer the question from another direction, because I've never lived that way. I've, I mean, I was a wife for three months. My mother forced me. You know, like I was 21 years old and I was married for three months and then I divorced the little punk. <laughs> you know, I divorced him <clears throat> because he was abusing me. I mean, from the night of the marriage, he started to bully me. I was like, huh? <laughs> Nobody does that to me. So I got, I divorced him and I told him, this is my wedding present to you. <laughs> and he never got over it. He's dead now, but he never got over it. <laughs> never got over it and the women in the community were so angry at my mother that she had not done the surveillance and the control over me and she, they accused my mother of disrespecting them not me with me they just looked at me like I was some wild thing that you don't go near because it bites but they uh, oh yeah even now now that I've come back I'm a feminist I don't eat meat you know in southern Africa brying is like you know what brying is like the barbecue right people poison themselves every weekend with that toxicity you know but it's like the big social event and I don't eat it I always carry my little cooler bag with my carrots that I've grown and my beetroots and my salad and my textured soy you know it's beautiful food and everybody's like, give me more, give me, me, give me that steak, give me that pork. And I'm sitting there eating my beautiful food that is not going to harm me. You know, and they're like, who does she think she is? Why don't you eat the same food as us? You're always making yourself different. I'm like, it's a choice, you know. You want to be like everybody or you can be yourself. Choose, all right? So I've never lived like that. But I can tell you that this is an issue that feminists have been struggling with for a long time. And it's, uh, and it's because we've assumed that these women want to be freed. You cannot free people, they free themselves. That's a deep political lesson I learned from being in the nationalist movement. And women who stay in the institutions, in the infrastructures of patriarchy and capitalism, they choose to be there. It's a choice because you have human agency. You have the ability to leave. And some of us leave. So why is it that you don't? Because you're conforming, you have no courage. Well, you know, everybody arrives with courage. This is a core part of your integrity as a human. You have courage. You can, you know, I mean, you can craft your trajectory, your destiny. So they stay there and they collude and they participate. And then we, the feminists, the gender activists, want to go and explain to the women when the man is beating them, when the, the pastors are raping their daughters. We want to explain to them that, you know, uh, we have to find a way to live with men because we need men. I mean, that's just heterosexuality. Compulsory heterosexuality teaches women 
that they cannot exist outside of the infrastructure of the heteropatriarchal family. And women learn it from girlhood, that you cannot be yourself, individual, autonomous. But when you realize that you are enough, the, who you are is enough for you. You are enough. And the whole notion of sufficiency for me is not only about you know, really understanding patriarchy in depth and encountering it from so-called people who, people who so-called love me because that myths that family love you, that that's the safe place. We all know that the majority of women are violated and killed in families, what are called families. The heterosexual family is the most dangerous place for women. And millennia, over millennia, women have kept that secret on behalf of men. You see, we have colluded. And colluding is a major challenge, political challenge for us when we think about the alternative, being free women in the alternative ways. And I just don't understand it. Like I say, you know, I mean, I was married to this guy for three months. And I decided, oh no, <laughs> I'm out of here. And I was gone. I never looked back. Instead, I scrutinize these institutions of patriarchy, and I don't go in, you see. And so, you know what? I mean, I have a beautiful life, okay? I mean, I love this woman called Patricia, mm -hmm. you know? Because I made her the most important person in my life, and I refused anybody to humiliate her. Let me tell you, I become 12 feet tall if you try to humiliate me. I rage. So I don't swallow insult, you know? I, my son, whom I lost, whom I talked about, he used to say to me, oh, but Pat, you know, do, do you have to? I say, yes, I do. That's why I'm your mother. And that's why you are this amazing person you are, because I'm fierce. You don't put insult and humiliation on me, you know? That's my integrity. And it's because we've learned not to be uncompromising about it that we collude, that they kill us, that they insult us, that they exploit us, and we allow it. I mean, at this stage in my life, my dear, I've realized that we allow most of what happens to us as humans. We allow it. And when we stop saying, when we start saying no and actually mean it, it will change. It will change. Any other questions? Yes, please. And presentism. Yeah, presentism. So the, so the idea that you're, that you're talking about sort of this like nationalist, um, hetero, you know, the sort of heteronormative nature of nationalism yes. seems to me sort of uh, related to the notion of, of Thank presentism. You for coming. That, um, Thanks. That nationalism is in some ways informed by uh, like an intense focus on now. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's, it's a big question. <laughs> but basically, uh, my argument is that nationalism has stultified the creative energies, political, creative, artistic, of Africans. Because it was a big platform, it was led by a group of men who really had a yearning to be rulers. Because they, be, they, they felt that they had been displaced by colonialism, which it did. You know, it displaced them as rulers. That's why in many of our societies, the men who were leading nationalist movements came from the ru former ruling classes. Mm -hmm. From your Mandela's to your Nkrumah's to all of them, they came from these feudal class backgrounds where they had been privileged, but had been uh, dispossessed by colonialism, you know. And the working people, the ones who came from the rural spaces who were the producers of food and all that, they always were the foot soldiers 
you know, they were, for example, in the South African struggle, they were the Mkonto Westies, where they were the, the military wing, you know. But always the class infrastructures, the feudal class infrastructures were retained within the liberation movement. You can look at all of them. They were like, except maybe Azapo in South Africa, which was much more radical because it was more urban based and coming from uh, the dynamics of resisting within urban spaces where feudalism was not as entrenched. But your ANC and your PAC and all those guys, they had a nostalgia to rule. And they actually drove these liberation movements. They crafted nationalism within the context of Africa as an anti-colonial uh, politics to esconce themselves in, back into the state, which is what they did, okay? So my critique is that uh, nationalism, which is often treated as uh, an opportunity to think about identity in ways that are linked with nation and country and geography and space, you know, that for, for me, nationalism, the flavor of nationalism on the continent translates into an impact in terms of radical politics. I'm not interested in, I don't have a country and I don't want a country. You know, the only reason I call myself Swazi, Swazi is because I have to have a passport, you know. I can't move without it because it's part of the surveillance of humans. But actually, I don't have a country and I don't want anybody to offer me a country because it's just a liability, you know. So I, for me, what is more important is to critique nationalism. Yes, it is a, a liability because look at how they recruit the children of the working people to fight the wars. I mean, and your society is the quintessential expression of that. So my critique of nationalism is that it, 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 um, it stultifies, you know, it, it blocks the creative energies of our society. And so contemporarity is about shifting away from nationalism to craft the new political ideologies and create the new discursive spaces there. But I don't know what presentism is. I have not come across it. I, and I really, you know, I'm, I'm already grappling with contemporarity, so I, I won't go any further. <laughs> I do, I won't. Because, ooh, you know, I'm like excited, but I'm a little bit daunted by the possibilities that contemporary is not going to take me as far as I want to go intellectually. But I'm going to explore it and see, maybe I can attach a few other little bits to it, you know, and expand it. But that's basically what I'm talking about. Yes, ma'am. Will contemporary take you, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. <laughs> Yes. of your talk, and I, forgive me for not quite remembering the context in which you alluded to Black Lives Matter, yes. but I'm wondering yes. how or if there is a possibility to rec uh, reconcile this new you, as it were, um, you know, as perhaps a template for other ways of being, with uh, political movement. Yes, it's actually something that I am kind of uh, troubling in a way because um, I don't have a replacement for movements, for, for the large, the macro organizing, I don't. And I, I tell myself that this is a, a, a short transitional moment where I'm returning to the South so that I can see the possibilities. Because also if, when I look at the landscape, the political landscape in Southern Africa, from, and also here, yeah, I can see that there's, a, the, the, for example, the fallists in South Africa, the roads must fall, led to a fallist movement. So there was fall, the fees must fall, the, you know, the statues must fall and all that. But the discourse was still located within the old nationalist you know, um, epistemologies, the, the ways of thinking about ourselves as black people. The young ones haven't invented the new forms of activism. Personally, I mean, I'm like out of it. I'm not going to be part of new movements because time is not on my side. And also, really and truly, there are things I do better than situating myself in the new surge. I think that 
for my generation, we should try and do the things that we, we've been doing for 40, 50 years, 60 years. We should try and do them better and bring them to the new moment in the newest ways that we can. So for example, being vegan and linking that with healing and with wellness and with living in an, uh, an aging body. That for me is the important way in which I contribute to the emerging feminism. You know, because older women will be part uh, as long as we're alive, we are part of the radical, you know, uh, epistems and the activist uh, contexts that are surrounding us, that, uh, that we live in. But I don't think we should position ourselves in these uh, new waves. I don't think so. Because then what we do is it's like men going into women's organizations. They bring the privilege of maleness and voice into those, move, uh, those sites and they... They intimidate women, even though they declare themselves, I'm a feminist man, you know, and I respect women. I'm like, get yourself your own identity. Stop calling yourself a feminist. You have a different relationship with patriarchy. How can you name yourself from a relationship that women have resisting patriarchy? You're a beneficiary of patriarchy. It doesn't matter if you're a tramp or if you are Soros, you know. You still are a, you're privileged by patriarchy. So don't name yourself using our identity that comes from resisting patriarchy. Get yourselves together as guys and find a name that speaks to your rejection of patriarchal privilege. Stop hitching your wagon on women's political identity because you drag the women back. You see, you drag the women and you reorient the direction. Oh, I have big fights with young men who are like, you know what, you're exclusionary. This is an... I'm like, honey, listen to what I'm saying. It's true. Find your own identity, you know, because you need to do that. So it's like being an older feminist too. I don't think we should interpolate ourselves into Black Lives Matter the movement, but we can write, we can speak with the young ones, and we can say that the forms we use to fight against capitalism and exclusion belonged to the moment of resistance that we were part of. But the young ones have to find the new forms, the new expressions. You know, they have to, because it's another moment. It's another, it's a new moment. Otherwise, the energy and the opportunities of this new moment become depleted mm -hmm. and become, it's like, you know, I mean, there are some people who just absorb all the oxygen in, in, in movements, you know, not because they are bad, but because they just don't actually realize that it's time to step back, lean back and let the new wave, um, that's my position. So I hope I explain. I mean, I answered your question because I tend to get delighted. <laughs> All right. So are you tired now? You want to go now? Okay. You're saturated, I hope. Did it give you pleasure? Yes. All right. That's why you come to this place, to have pleasure. You, you, if you're not having pleasure, tell the professor because the point about pleasure is that it opens up your creative capacities. Mm -hmm. You must feel pleasure. And you mustn't have pain in your body, in your life, no pain. So if somebody's giving you pain, get rid of them. <laughs> and you know, I mean, yeah, no pain. It's a lie that, oh, you know, pleasure and pain are this dynamic binary, you know, da 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 da, you need one to have the other. No. Uh uh. Only pleasure. <laughs> Okay, have beautiful lives.